Welcome to NOAA Live, everybody. My name is Nicole Bartlett. I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work. And uh, that is a collection of people across the country who help connect people to all that NOAA does. Our amazing partner is Woods Hole Sea Grant, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. To find out about future webinars, you can look under the education tab on their webpage or simply follow them on Facebook. This is the second webinar in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts during these weeks of school closures. Today, we're introducing you to my friend Allison Henry, who is a member of our right whale aerial survey team based on Cape Cod at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. She's going to talk to you about her job and how she helps understand and protect our whale populations. A few housekeeping items before I introduce Allison. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and want to make sure that everyone can hear our speaker. However, there is a box where you can write questions. So go ahead and locate that now. Uh, we encourage you to ask them as we go. And I will be keeping track for Allison and just interrupt her every now and again and get her to answer a few of those questions for you. Depending on your device, how you access the question box may be different. For some of you, it may be a question mark on the bottom or side of the screen. Others might have a little box with an arrow and a hand. Click on the arrow to show the box, and we will not be using the raise hand function. Okay, so uh, Allison, just to give you a quick update, we have folks from New Jersey, Cape, a lot of places here on Cape Cod. So welcome to all of our folks uh, here on the Cape. We've got Newfoundland, Rhode Island. We also have folks from, let's see, Melrose, Massachusetts and Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. So someone in the warm weather. <laughs> we also have folks from Halifax, uh, <coughs> Boulder, Colorado, uh, Ontario, Canada, um, Tacoma, Washington, Stratham, New Hampshire, the UK, and Luxembourg. Am I making you nervous? <laughs> we also have folks from Alabama and Kansas, uh, Ipswich, Mass, Hickory, North Carolina, Florida, again, more Seattle, Maryland, Bath, Maine, Syracuse, New York, Cypress, Texas, Charleston, South Carolina. So, everywhere we are everywhere so allison i'm going to turn it over to you um to get started and again just uh make sure you take a breath so i can um uh interrupt you with all the fine questions that are coming in okay i'm going to make you the presenter now all right my turn okay <laughs> show my screen let's see everybody can see me i hope oh that's not me that's me. Now you can see me. Yes, right. I can see you. All right. <clears throat> so yeah, my name is Allison Henry. I work for the Northeast Fisheries Science Center in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Technically, I am a fishery biologist, but I do not study fish. I study whales, which is actually a lifelong dream of mine. I have my dream job. I have been in love with whales since I was about six years old. So kindergarten, first grade, a good friend of mine liked whales, so I decided to like whales. And then I just never stopped. I never grew out of that, I want to be a marine biologist phase. Um, when I was in school, I learned as much as I could about whales. When I was 10, my grandparents adopted a humpback whale for me for my birthday. His name is Colt, and I've actually seen him in person in the waters just off the Cape here. So. Uh, that's always super exciting when I see Colt. High school, I took marine biology classes. In college, I went to school on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. Not a lot of whales in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, lots of crabs and fish and stuff. So I did not get to really start studying whales until just out of college when I moved to Massachusetts and I started studying humpback whales from a boat. Now, now I study right whales from the air. Now, how many of you are even heard of a right whale. So this is a right whale. This is my, my model right whale. <clears throat> now, if you um, want to learn about whales in general, 
the different kinds, marine mammals, what makes a marine mammal a marine mammal. My friend and colleague, Grace Simpkins, did a really nice webinar on Monday talking all about marine mammals and the differences between the whales. So if you have any questions, I really suggest you go and watch that. It's on the Woods Hole Sea Grant um, website. So you can go and watch that. And also ask any questions during this, but make sure you use your computer, use your parents, ask questions, Google answers, and you should be able to find what you're looking for. Okay, so a right whale is distinctive in a few ways. It does not have a dorsal fin on its back. Like if you see a shark or a fish, dorsal means back, and it usually has a little fin, but right whales don't. Another distinctive feature is these paddle-shaped flippers. Other whales have sort of pointy, skinny flippers. And thirdly, and this is the one I want you to remember, on the top of their heads are these rough white patches of skin, kind of like warts. We call these callosities. So that's something to remember because I'm going to talk about that later. Now, why is this called the right whale and not the left whale or the wrong whale? It's the right whale. And it got that nickname, unfortunately, because of whalers. Decades ago, we didn't have oil out of the ground like we do now. A lot of the oil that we use to light our lamps, to heat our homes, came from the blubber, came from the fat of whales. Right whales are very fat. They weigh about 50 tons, about 55, 60 feet long. They're not the biggest whale. Anybody know what the biggest whale is? It's the blue whale. Right whales are about half the size of that. But all that fat means that they could provide a lot of oil. Right whales also tend to live pretty close to shore. So the whalers didn't have to go as far to get them. In fact, if you live in Massachusetts right now, you might be able to see whales from shore off Nahant and Race Point in Provincetown. Talk about that later. Another reason they're the right whale to kill is because they're pretty slow. They swim at about four miles an hour. So all of that made it easy for the right whale, for the whalers to kill them. And unfortunately they did. Thousands, thousands of right whales were killed by whalers. And because of that, now we only have about 400 whales left in the entire Northern Atlantic. They are an endangered species, which means that we need to do everything we can to help protect this population, to help the population grow in numbers. Okay, anybody have any questions so far? Well, we did have a question about how fast whales swim, so you answered that without even prompting. One thing I forgot to mention, and I don't think anyone can read the letters on your shirt, but uh, NOAA stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So a few people had asked about that, and they also asked how many NOAA are there? And I think the number of NOAA employees is somewhere, including contractors, around 20,000 um, everywhere. Uh, so primarily across the country, but we do have NOAA people in other countries um, in certain places. So we can get back to whale business. Okay. <laughs> whale business. Okay, so I'm going to show you where right whales live. Now these are the North Atlantic right whales, indicating they live where? The North Atlantic. That's a pretty big place. So let me change this slide. Can you all see that? There we go. So this is the eastern coast of North America. Now, right whales live in the entire Northern Atlantic, but most of the ones we see are sighted somewhere in this blue zone. So off of Newfoundland, Labrador, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, or Nova Scotia up in Canada, coming down into the Gulf of Maine off the coast of the US, down along the Mid-Atlantic, and into the southeast. In fact, we have some whales off of Georgia and northern Florida right now. This is the calving ground. This is where adult females will go to give birth. And sometimes they'll keep going and bang a right and go into the Gulf of Mexico. We have had whales sighted off of Greenland and Iceland. And last year, a whale was sighted off of France. And just a week or so ago, there was a mom calf in the Gulf of Mexico. So they can go pretty much anywhere. Now, if you want to study whales, you need to be able to find them. And that's a really big ocean. That's a really big haystack for 400 needles. So <clears throat> here's, whoop, let me go back. Here's where I am, Massachusetts on Cape Cod. And this is where I work in Woods Hole. 
So if you were, if you wanted to try to find a whale in that big, vast ocean, what are the ways you think you could do it? You could go out on a boat, which I do, I do that as well, but boats can't always get so far out. And sometimes we can't go out because of weather. Mm -hmm. You can use acoustics, which my friend Genevieve will be talking about next week, how we put underwater microphones in the water to listen and try to find the whales. And that can be very helpful, but if the whales aren't talking, we're not gonna be able to pick them up that way. So what I tend to be on is an airplane. And here's our beautiful plane, if you can see it, there we go. And this is a Noah twin otter. She's actually had a paint job since then. And I like to call it the Cadillac of the aerial survey teams. We are not the only aerial survey that goes out because that's too much ocean to cover for just one plane. But we fly in this plane, we've got two pilots that fly the plane. We've got these windows on the side, these bubble windows for the two observers. Whoops, go back. This is actually me in this little window right here. <clears throat> And we have a data recorder because we're not just out there looking for the whales, we're also collecting data at the same time. Now, before you think being in a plane is super glamorous, let me tell you some truths. It's not very comfortable, even though that's the Cadillac of the aerial survey planes. You have to spend your time, this is what you do, because you have that bubble window on the side of the plane. You're gonna stick your head on there, you're gonna twist your body, and you're gonna do this for about three hours looking for whales. And then you'll switch to the other side of the plane and do it the other way. So we need chiropractors and masseuses. It's cold out there. It can get very boring if we fly for about five hours. So if you're only seeing water and you're not seeing whales, that can get very, very boring. So when we fly, we fly at a thousand feet and we fly at a hundred miles an hour, which for a plane is pretty slow. And what we do what we call is mowing the lawn. So this is a flight from about a month ago. We leave from the Cape, we fly down here and then we just start mowing the lawn. We go back and forth and back and forth. And we don't use any special equipment to find the whales. We don't use radar, we don't use sonar, we use our eyeballs, tried and true method. And what we do is just like the whalers, we look for the blow or the spout of the whale. This is not water being shot into the air, no matter what the cartoons and movies tell you, it's condensed air from inside the whale's lungs. These whales are mammals, they breathe air and they have two blowholes or nostrils on the top of their heads. And when they exhale, they do it so fast, they, sneeze, they breathe at about 300 miles an hour. We sneeze at 100 miles an hour. So that sort of condenses and atomizes the air and blows it up. Kind of like when we go outside in the winter too, when you see your breath, that's what you're looking at. It is not water, but it's pretty tall. It can be about eight to 10 feet in the air. So we look for those blows, we look for the whales, we look for any splashing they're doing. And because we're at about a thousand feet in the air, we can see pretty far. We can see about three to five miles. Now, when we think we see a whale, we stop mowing the lawn and we start making red spaghetti. I'm waiting for it to, there we go. So what happened here was we break track, we saw a whale, we broke track, we came over here, we sort of looped around. Oh wait, there it is, oh. And there's another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. Oh, there's some over here. Oh, there's some over here. So we thought that there was just one whale, but when we broke track and started circling, we found that there were actually 12. And this is what it looks like to a whale. Here's a couple whales in the, on the surface of the water. And here's our plane, 1,000 feet up. We start to circle, here's the perspective from our pilots. Again, we have NOAA core pilots, men and women that fly us around and help us stay on the whales and we're taking pictures. So this is actually a shadow of our plane being cast across a whale. Because not only are we collecting data about where the animal is and what it's doing, but by taking a picture, we can find out who that whale is. 
have any questions? I'm about to talk about how we do that, but do you have any questions right now? Yeah, so we've got a couple, uh, a lot of questions coming in. So I'm trying to be patient because Allison's covering some of the questions that you're going to be asking. Um, one of them asked, how many people are in the plane when you're flying? Did you oh, say good that? question. We have two pilots, two observers, and a data recorder. Okay, so it's pretty small crew. Um, how many miles are you flying in a trip? You said you were up for about three hours. Do you know how much distance yeah. you cover? So for those of you who are a little more advanced in math, we fly at 100 miles an hour and we fly for about five hours. Oh. So maybe write that equation down and figure it out. But in general, we can cover about 500 miles, usually, usually less because we have to figure in transiting and how much time we spend circling. We can eat up a lot of time doing this, but we're and usually that, out for about five to six hours. Okay, perfect. I think I did that math. We'll see if the kids in home. Oh, Charlotte Vieira says 500 miles. She figured Great it out. Great time, time to do Yeah. Um, so the other questions we had are, um, well, Grace covered this a bit on Monday, but the weight and length of right wells, how big are they? Did they you are about 55 feet long and weigh about 50 tons, 45 to 50 tons. Great. Thank you. Um, and then, oh, a good sort of question before you transition to the next next one is are whales social ah this is a good time um, it depends on your type of whale they're all social but they're social in different ways um, when you hear about a pod of whales people always talk about pods that's usually tightly knit social family groups that are usually toothed whales dolphins, porpoises, sperm whales. You'll see those animals traveling together in tight groups. Baleen whales, like a right whale, they're more acoustically social. They do social distancing because they can communicate across pretty great distances through the ocean, through the water. So you'll, they usually travel singly or in pairs, but they're constantly talking to other whales. So even though they might not be next to each other, they are being social. If you have a lot of baleen whales in an area together, we usually call that an aggregation. And it's more because they're there to eat, that there's a lot of food. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that sounds great. And um, the one, there was another question here from somebody that I thought you would like to respond to. Let's see. I think it was Allison. Well, I'm going to have to find it again. Um, but yeah, because it was an Allison, I wanted to ask you, but I'll, I'll dig it up. Um, the yeah. other thing, what, if, what do you only look for right whales or do you see other whales too? Are you looking specifically for yours and do you do anything if you find other mammals while you're out there? Well, we have changed the way we survey. There's all sorts of different types of aerial surveys. A different project that I've been part of records everything they see. Um, sharks, fish, turtles, uh, manta rays, dolphins, seals, and the like. Um, I actually just read an article about an aerial survey being done in Australia monitoring the coral reefs. Um, so, but when we fly, we are primarily looking for right whales, but we're looking for any large whales. So if we see anything else, if we see minke whales or finbacks or say whales, we will include those in our data as well. We just don't usually spend as much time circling over those all right great well, we have one more question before you go on from ellen in falmouth she'd like to know if you can swim with right whales no <laughs> <laughs> um and that's because there are rules for right whales you have to because they are an endangered species like i mentioned earlier we are required people are required to stay more than 500 yards away from them if you're out on the water if and a whale surfaces near you, you need to move slowly away from that whale until there's a safe distance because there's just so few of them, we don't want to make have any accidents happen. And it's really cold in the waters up here and the visibility isn't great. So you wouldn't want to be in the water anyway. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. You're very welcome. 
Okay. I'm going to move on to my favorite part. One of my favorite parts of my job is um, photo ID, which is how we tell the whales apart. So I mentioned before that whole callosity thing, those rough white patches. Each one, actually, I'm going to bring it back to me for a second. A callosity is going to be, it's like the whale version of our thumbprint. No two right whales look the same. That callosity pattern is going to be unique for each individual one. Okay. Okay. I'm jumping back and forth. So if you look at these callosity patterns here, if you start up here at the top of their head or their rostrum and move down the head, you see a big white rough patch, then some smooth black, then a couple small rough patches, then some more black, and another white patch. So this whale's callosity pattern is sort of, it's broken into pieces. So we call that a broken callosity. This one over here, you start at the top and you go all the way down in one continuous piece. So we call that a continuous whale. And those are the two basic categories. You can get into more specifics. Uh, like this one has two patches behind its blowholes. Here's the nostrils on the top of the head that I was talking about. And here's a little bit of that mist that you see when they spout. This one has one patch. It also has some rough patches on the lips. So those are some examples of how we try to figure out the different whales from each other. So I'm gonna give you a little test. <clears throat> and we want to know who this whale is. If we start here and we start going down, we see that it's one continuous piece. So that means it's not number one and it's not number three because those are broken. Looking back here again, I see some bumps. We call those peninsulas on either side. We see some bumps here, some bumps here. But I see that this one has big lip callosities. And I don't see those on this whale. I see a little white scar though. Oh, look, there's the little white scar. So that means that this right whale is this one, number two. And actually, now that I know that who that whale is, I can tell you a little bit more about it. That is right in the whale number 1037. All of our whales are cataloged and you can look this up. So if you just Google the right whale catalog, it'll take you to the New England Aquarium in Boston's website. They are the ones that manage and catalog all the photographs that we take. An average flight, we can take about 10 photos a whale. So if we have a flight with 60 whales, that's 600 photos to go through and figure out who is who. So 1037, I can tell you, is an adult male. And he was first seen in 1980. How old do you think he is? Well, we don't actually know because when he was first seen in 1980, he was an adult at that time. They become adults around age eight or nine. So he had to be eight or at least eight or nine then. That means he's probably close to 50 years old, if not older. I also know that he doesn't really like to go to the Southeast. Most of his sightings have been up in the Northern, northern waters off the Cape and in the Bay of Fundy isn't surprising because not a lot of males go down to the south. That's for females when they give birth. Now, how does knowing who a whale is help us protect them? On the immediate term, here's an example. So down on the southeast, again, that's where females go to give birth. And this year we've had 10 moms, at least that we know of, have babies, which is wonderful. But we also had some other adult females down there who we'd hoped would be moms. One of them, a whale number 2040, whose name is Natus. Some of them have names, some of them don't. So we we're hoping that she would have a baby. But then we saw her on one of our flights up here about mm, a couple weeks ago. So we know that this is not her year to have a calf. And that's how knowing who that whale is can help us keep track of what's going on. If you know something about that one specific whale, you can follow them and learn about their sightings. You can learn where they like to go, what they like to do. And then you expand that and you can learn about the whole population and pick up on their habits and that helps us protect them. Now, some other ways we can help in the moment, when we go out and fly, we don't always see the nicest things. And whales are no longer hunted, but they are still in a lot of trouble. When we fly, sometimes we can find a dead whale. And what we would do from the plane is we would call the stranding network. 
so that hopefully either they can take scientists out to the whale or bring the whale to the scientists to conduct an animal autopsy or a necropsy to find out what's happened. Or if unfortunately we find a whale that is entangled in fishing gear, we can call the disentanglement team and hopefully they can come out and help that whale and we can help them do that. I'm not gonna go into details about how to disentangle whales. I will leave that to the experts. Um, there are some really great resources, but if you have questions, maybe we can answer a few of those without getting into details. So the thing about entanglements and vessel strikes, this is a big ocean and we all want to use it. Fishers fish, boaters boat. If we want things shipped across the country, it has to come on a vessel. And it often comes into ports and whales, like I said before, right whales hang around near the coast. So <sighs> whales get entangled and whales get hit by boats, but pretty much all of that is accidental. But that doesn't mean that it's not a problem and we want to try to fix it. So one way, another way, our flights and our data help is, so here's all the whales that have been sighted in the past. Oh, you can't see it. Hold on. Uh -huh. uh, there we go. Here's all the whale sightings from the past two weeks. Anybody who sees a whale is going to call our hotline, and then we will put it into our Google Maps. So you can do this too. Go to Google and search right whale sightings map, and you'll have re near real time reports of where whales have been sighted. So these whales down here are ones we've sighted on our flights. The ones in Cape Cod Bay have been sighted by another aerial survey team from the Center for Coastal Studies. And all these ones up here off of Boston and the North Shore have been reported from vessels and even from shore. Now how we help, see this box here? You know how outside your school, there's a flashing yellow light that tells people to slow down. This is the same sort of speed zone for right whales. There is a school open here from the fall through the spring and all boats have to slow down. Now these yellow boxes are where schools have kind of popped up. We found groups of whales in those areas. So we wanna create at least a temporary slowdown zone. So that's what these yellow boxes are. And again, all of this is informed by our data and data from other observers and scientists. Allison, could you give yeah. that Google, Google map search? Um, again, a few people didn't catch where they could find that. Just look Did for you... right whale sightings map. Right whale sightings map. Yep. And you can right. search, it'll show the East Coast, um, again, these are only whales that have been reported to us. And you can search by date, you can search across time. If you zoom out, you can even see whales that have been sighted again off of France and Iceland. And it goes, it includes data all the way back into the, I think the earlier one, earliest one in there might be in the 1920s. Great, thank you. Okay. Actually, while we've stopped, does anybody have? Any other questions? Oh, Allison, there are so many questions. I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to get through them. So you mentioned uh, about ship strikes and things like that. Do right whales have natural predators? Um, yeah, well, humans, unfortunately, but orcas and sometimes sharks, and it's more on calves or younger animals. We do have we do have killer whales or orcas in the Atlantic. We just They just don't get as much attention as the ones in the Pacific. We have whales that have orca rake marks, teeth marks on their flippers or on their tails where um, an orca gave chase. We have seen a single orca in the past few years, nicknamed as Old Tom. He's been showing up off, off the Cape, but usually oh. adults don't have to worry about it. Interesting. Um, do families of right whales have similar markings? Henry would like to know. You know, that is a really good question. And there is a group of students up in Maine called the Calvineers. And one of their students did a little test looking at callosity patterns. And basically it turned out that not really. It's not like, I look a lot like my mom, for example. Um, it's not really that case. We do have some whales. Um, there's a whale named 
um, slalom and her calf mogul look really similar to each other, but most of the time it doesn't. And how long is the average lifespan of a right whale? We don't know. Uh, okay. We think about 90 years, possibly longer. They are relatives of the bowhead whale uh, who lives up in the Arctic and bowheads, I think live to be 150 to 200 years old. Um, we have, we've really only been studying right whales since the 70s, 80s. So maybe about half the lifetime span so far, but unfortunately, most of them are not living until old age. Um, Maisie in Falmouth would love to know how many whales you see in an average trip. That's a very good question. It kind of depends. The most we've had is 100, a little over 100. Um, I'd say average is maybe 40 or 50. It just depends on where we're flying in the time of the year. Sometimes we have zero. Okay, and do whales sleep? Very good question. Yes, but whales are conscious breathers. They're voluntary breathers. They have to think and decide to breathe. Can you imagine having to do that? So what they do when they rest is we call it logging. They just kind of float at the surface. And what they do is they shut down half of their brain at a time. So one half is sleeping, the other half is awake and making sure they breathe and kind of keeping aware of what's going around. And then they'll wake up and either go back to sleep and switch to the other side, or that they'll sort of take little cat naps throughout the day. Okay, thank you. And then how do you tell a male and a female right whale apart? Did you mention that already? I did not. And that's also a good question. Um, the easiest way to do it is that if you see a whale with a calf, that's a mom. Um, the calves will spend about a year with their moms. Um, the other way to do it is if sometimes whales can get involved in what we call a surface active group. You get a lot of whales and they're all rolling around and sometimes it's for mating purposes, sometimes it's just a social activity, but a lot of times they'll be belly up and you'll be able to see their genital area. And when we do that and we take pictures of that, then you can tell if it's a male or female just based on the, the shape of that area. You what can also, actually, there's another way to do it. We can, from a boat, so this is something we can't do from the plane, we can collect um, skin samples. So a small sample of skin about the size of a pencil eraser, and we can learn all sorts of stuff from that, including what the gender is. Awesome. Um, Anna would like to know, what's the rarest whale you've seen? Probably the right whale. Because they're pretty rare, right? Yeah, Compared they're very rare. Um, there are right whales in the North Pacific, which are even more rare. The North Pacific right whale, that's on my water bottle here. There's maybe about 100 of those left. Um, I have not seen one of those. Um, I've seen bowheads, but I think they have, they're doing a little better than the right whale. David would like to know whether the placement of offshore wind farms have affected whales. That is an excellent question. And as one we're starting to look at, I don't have an answer yet. Um, off the cuff, it's possible that that's the noise, the vibration, because these are, these are, although whales have good vision, they rely on their hearing. And I know that there have been studies shown that sound can cause stress. For example, an unintentional outcome of 9-11 was there's the, the New England Aquarium has been doing some long-term research up in the Bay of Fundy. And part of the research they do is collect poop. That's right, poop. They would use dogs to do it. And looking at the poop, they can look at the stress hormone level. And after 9-11, when shipping stopped for a while, all the stress dropped. And it makes me think of when I'm in a loud restaurant or when I'm in a loud bar and it's really hard for me to hear my friends, it stresses me out. So I think that noise is, is going to be an issue for the whales. Great. I think that's a good place to stop. And oh, you know, actually, there are a number of questions. You anticipated this about what right whales eat. OK. Which, yeah. All right. Right whales, for such a big animal, eat a teeny tiny, I don't have any with me, um, 
plankton, zooplankton called a copepod. It's this itty bitty, it's smaller than a grain of rice. But this is what those big animals eat, not basmati, pretend it's copepods. So, but they, they don't have teeth. They have baleen and that's what I have behind me. I'm gonna be very careful with this because it's really, really long. <laughs> baleen is made out, I can't even, can't even fit this. Um, it's made out of a protein called keratin. Same as our fingernails, same as our hair, same as horses hooves. It's a really tough material. And what, here, I'm gonna show you. This is a right whale one and I, I can't even show you how long it is. It's taller than me, taller than I rather. Um, but here is some minke whale baleen. So this, these baleen plates hang from the upper jaw of their mouth. And this is the outside and this is the inside. So this is all pretty hairy. Have you seen the movie Finding Nemo? When Nemo and Dory get trapped in the whale's mouth and it looks like they're sort of butting up against almost broom material. So what happens is the whales, they take a big mouthful of seawater and copepods and they can't drink seawater because they're mammals like we are. So they wanna get all that out. So they close their mouth, they push their tongue up towards the roof of their mouths and all that water goes through these baleen plates, but the copepods get trapped against the inside and then they swallow. If you've ever had jello salad, jello with the pieces of fruit inside and you close your mouth and you squish the jello in and out between your teeth, but you keep the fruit on the inside, it's the same, same sort of concept. So even though these animals live in the water, they actually never drink anything. They get all the fresh water that they need through the food that they eat. Can you that, explain to people how you have that, those whale samples? That is a good question. Um, again, these marine mammals are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. So these samples of baleen came from already stranded animals. You're not allowed to take any pieces of a marine mammal. Like if you're if you're on the beach and you see a dead seal or a dead turtle, you're not allowed to take away any pieces of it. Um, the government will collect those, the stranding networks will collect those, and then we get special permits to use those pieces for education because we really wanna make the most. We don't want any of these animals to die, but if they do, we wanna make sure we're using it the best way possible to advance science and to educate people about them. Great, thank you. Well, we have plenty of questions, but you can keep going if you have more. Okay, well, I just have one more slide in Great. terms of how we, people always wanna know like what they can do to help the whales. And I wish I could tell you that there's a specific thing, but really it is all the little stuff, all the little things you do like recycling reducing your use. If you've heard of microplastics, when plastic gets into the water and it breaks down to these little microscopic pieces, that gets magnified up the food chain. So that's one way you can help. You can also help by buying things that are made in the USA or that are made locally. Because if it's made in the USA, the best, the most likely way it's gonna to come to your house is on a truck or by train. It's not gonna be on a ship. Um, which helps reduce the probability of ship strikes. Um, you can also buy sustainably managed seafood. So if you, you know, like I said, fishers want to fish and whales want to swim and those things are going to overlap sometimes. So there's a lot of people working together to try to come up with ways to allow that to happen. Um, and you can use fish wash, fish watch to look for some sustainably sourced seafood. Another thing you can do, if you live near the coast, please don't release balloons. If you have helium balloons for a party or something, I know it's fun to watch them go up in the air, but please, please, please don't do it. We see balloons out there all the time, especially after holidays. Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, graduations, 4th of July, we'll see balloons out there. And marine life often can mistake that for food and try to eat that, and that's not a good thing. So those are some small ways you can help. Do cleanups, do beach cleanups. You can help support research organizations that study whales. You can adopt a whale. Um, that'll help too. Great, thanks, Allison. So um, some, you've actually answered in that 
that section there are a lot of questions that some folks have put up. Um, Nicole wants to know whether whales can see. See, yes, actually they can. They have really good vision and they have, they have eyes that they can sort of retract a little bit, push out and also retract. Um, because when you dive underwater, you know, it's, it gets a little blurry. So they have the ability when they're rolling at the surface to, to just change the structure of their eye to see above the water as well as below the water. And there's um, a, a scientist who's doing some really cool studies about what exactly a whale can see, like can they see colors and which colors. Um, but for the majority of the time, they're in waters that the visibility isn't very good. You can't even really see 10, 10 feet away. So even though they've got good vision, they rely mostly on their hearing. You mentioned if for folks who weren't here at the very beginning, because you talked about how your parents adopted a whale for you. The grandparents. Um, yeah, grandparents, excuse me. So some people like Eva and Michelle and Marlo and Greta and all wanted to know um, how you adopt a whale. So where should they find that? There are different um, nonprofit research organizations that have different, I mean, especially on both coasts. If you live on the West Coast, you might be able to adopt a gray whale. If you live on the East Coast, you can adopt one of our Gulf of Maine humpback whales. Um, and through the aquarium, the New England Aquarium, you can adopt a right whale. But I think if you just Google adopt a whale, you will probably find something that's in your region. So up here in New England, we know that um, there has been some discussion about ropeless lobster and crab traps. Um, do you know whether people are already converting to this new technology and if it's helping with the right whales? Well, it's definitely too soon to say if it's helping or not, but there are certainly different fishers who are uh, um, trying out this new technology. Um, with any new technology, there's some bugs to work out. There's some expenses to deal with. But what we know is that 85% of our whales have been entangled in gear at some point in their lives. So entanglements are happening. We just, we don't always know exactly where or in what kind of fishery. These are the sorts of questions that we try to find out with all the research that we do. But we know that if, if we can find a way so that there isn't rope in the water, then the whales can't get entangled into it. Is there a time of year when you do your surveys that you're more likely to see whales? Do you always fly at the same time of year or do you fly throughout the year? We are actually probably the only aerial survey team that flies roughly year round. Um, if we're not flying, it's more because of budget. It's because of money. We don't have the money to, to fly the plane. So, there are whales in the Gulf of Maine pretty much all the time. There are some seasonal aerial survey teams. So the Center for Coastal Studies flies in Cape Cod Bay in late winter to early spring. The survey teams in the southeast and the calving grounds uh, fly about that same time period. We've started to do a lot more aerial survey work up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence involving multiple planes. And that's usually starting in June and going through the fall. Do, um, how many right whales are born in a year? Uh, that has varied quite a bit. This year was 10, last year was seven. I think our record, our record low was um, 2000 where we had one calf born. Actually our record low was the year we had no calves. That was a few years ago. Our record high was 39 calves. Um, and what we really need to save this population is more babies. More babies and less deaths. It's pretty simple math. Other people are um, back to your uh, aerial surveys with you in the plane. They're very concerned. They want to know if you ever get sick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have always had a problem with motion sick. Anybody get car sick? Anybody get seasick, <laughs> air sick? And yet, I'm a marine biologist that does that. So, I have gotten used to it, but I still take precautions when I fly. I take my boning before I fly. I have, I sleep well, I eat well, I take my boning. I have Ziploc bags in my flight suit. Uh, I just got these fancy things from my boss. 
Pretty awesome, aren't they? So the way, way motion sickness works is your eyes are telling your brain one thing, and inside your ear, you've got semicircular canals. There are three different sort of tubes with hair and liquid in it, and they're telling your, your brain which way is up. So motion sickness is caused by your eyes telling your brain one thing and your ears telling your brain another, and it takes it on on your stomach. And it's a pretty awful feeling. I do get seasick and air sick pretty often, but I'm very stealthy about it in the plane. Most of the time people don't know that I'm getting sick. Um, so these are supposed to, because it's got fluid in the frames, it's supposed to help uh, on, on jarble on that message that my brain is getting. I haven't actually tried them out yet, but we'll see. Well, they, they look beautiful. Don't they? Aren't they attractive? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned groups of whales earlier. Evelyn would love to know how many whales are in a group when you, can it be two or is it very large or what, what is a group can, of whales? It's usually, you know, they're usually sort of single by themselves or maybe with another whale. Um, it just depends on how much food is in the area. If there's a lot of food, then we tend to see more whales. Is a large, what size would a large group of whales be? Hmm. Well, I've seen surface active groups. So that's where whales get together and are all rolling around. I think I had the biggest surface active group I saw had about 25 whales in it. Um, that's a lot of whale parts all splashing around. Um, but as far as feeding goes, there was one flight. It was April. It was in April of, oh, I can't remember when exactly, but we broke track because we saw a fluke print. We saw what we thought was one whale. And then we never went back to track because we had 102 whales that day. Do you know how many whales you've spotted this year so far? <laughs> I Penelope could would like to know. actually look that up. We haven't finished our photo ID. Well, let's see. I think our, our flight, we've had the highest number was 66. So I want to say at this point, we've probably seen 100 different individuals. And that's not including what the Center for Coastal Studies has seen in Cape Cod Bay. All right. And because we're at time, and it, we kind of went a little over, we have one more burning question. Everyone wants to know, how do you eat and do you eat on the plane and can you go to the bathroom on the plane? Oh, snacks are so important. Uh, I definitely bring a lot of food on the plane. Sometimes it's because, you know, those days when we don't see anything, it's really boring. I like to reward myself with a grape or a gummy bear at the end of a line, a track line. Um, and it is important to stay hydrated. It's really important to drink water. And on the plane, so our plane, again, it's the Cadillac of the survey planes. We do have a bathroom in the back. Not The other planes don't, they have to hold it for several hours. On our plane, we have a funnel and a tube. So we go to the back, we close the curtain, we use the funnel and the tube. Like astronauts. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> we don't need the diapers. <laughs> All right, Allison. Well, thank you so much for um, all your information that you shared today. Um, we had over 550 questions, um, of which we only answered a fraction. Um, but we encourage all of you folks to go um, online and do some research on your own to, to see if you can get those questions answered. On Monday, uh, Grace Simpkins had done a webinar um, really about all about marine mammals. And that webinar was, we had a little technical difficulties at the be beginning of that one. So Grace re-recorded -re that for you. And that's available on the same page that we are advertising this webinar series. Um, Allison's webinar was also recorded and will be available in a few days uh, if you have friends that you think would like this and missed it. Um, uh, this Friday, we're going to be talking to a satellite oceanographer, Kara Wilson, who's coming to us from Monterey, California, and she's going to be talking about how we use satellites in space to look at the ocean and understand habitat. So that will be very cool. Um, and next week, we have folks from the Office of Ocean Exploration, also the Weather Service, 
And then Allison's friend Genevieve is going to talk to us about whale sounds. So please join us for that. Thank you so much for logging in today and participating. And we hope you guys have a great week. Thanks, Allison. Thank you.